the royal barn palace. A storm was coming. Black clouds stretched across the sky, rolling in from the north. These thick, swelling clouds that were carried in by heavy winds began crying excessively as they poured gloomily on the land. And for a moment, everything stood still for a while, as even the wind had held its breath silently. The lightning flashed and split the dark horizon, instantly brightening up the streets. And slowly following the lightning was an earth-shaking thunderous sound from the heavens. It was just 11 a.m., yet the sky was dark, wet, and misty. Where is she? My king, my king, the third queen has locked herself in her chambers again. Alec Barn hit the wooden door, instantly smashing it open. This woman sure knew how to cause trouble for him. In the room sat a haggard but delicate barefooted woman, who sat on the floor around a pile of clothes and broken ornament pieces. The lightning illuminated the woman's side frame, forming a scary-like appearance. And when the thunder echoed through, the maids standing behind Alec were scared silly. At this point, the woman looked like a vengeful ghost here to take the souls of the guilty. Just how long are you going to act like this? Alec asked with a hint of disgust on his face. It's been six months since their daughter Jeanette had passed away, and since then, he hadn't been able to get any action with her. Amongst his wives, she was the only one who had managed to keep her luscious figure and youthful glow. Hence she was the only one who had been pleased him thoroughly. Sure, there were several harlots and sex workers around the palace, but only she knew how to do that thing with her tongue so well, so he had no choice but to pacify her and hope that she would be in the mood. He had made up his mind that by next month if she wasn't ready yet, then he would just lock her in a room and force her to have perform her wifely duties. Who was the boss? He was, that's who. He was the man. And he had married her into his family, not the other way around. It really annoyed him that he had to pamper her, a mere third wife, for the sake of pleasure. Women. Truth be told, he wasn't really sad or angry that his daughter died. After all, women really weren't important to him. He had grown to love his sons, but his daughters were a different matter. They could at best be used to as bait to form political treaties, get powerful men and families under him and so on, or a way to please and appease powerful empires or continents that want war against Arcadina. They were just political tools to be used for future purposes, so why should he be sad? What really annoyed him was that someone had the guts to insult him by doing such an act under his very nose. For him, that was the important point of note here. Argenia, that was his third wife's name. Within this six-month period, she had stopped taking care of herself and had slowly started taking the appearance of a savage. If not for the fact that she was the only one who knew his body so well, would he ever come here to beg or pacify her? No matter how he explained what he wanted done during his sexual activities, those hatlots could never get it right like Argenia. She was a pro. She had been with him for more than 15 years now, and she knew just what to do, where to touch and how to please him. Nothing could beat years of experience. She's never coming back, so how long are you going to keep this up? You kept your window open this entire time? Can't you see that the water is seeping in, into the room? She's dead for heaven's sake. So let it go. Alex said while trying to endure the foul stench coming out from the bedroom chambers. Every time a maid would come in attempts to clean the room, Adrian would throw a fit and start attacking them. All she wanted was peace and quiet. Yet these people kept talking to her and pestering her. When it was time to eat or take a bath, the maids would knock on the door and relay their message from outside. No matter what, she had forbidden them to step into her chambers. She didn't want anyone in her space. Period. Argenia stared angrily at Alec, as her body trembled from anger. Dead? Let it go? Never. Wasn't Jeanette his daughter as well? How can he be so heartless? She knew what he truly wanted. After so many years together, how could she not know how his mind worked? In her eyes, he was truly a bastard. For these past months, she had turned the city upside down just to find the culprit. And she had also sent her men to different cities, towns, and even villages to see if they could find the culprit, but no one had turned up yet. Six months of turning round and round with no culprit yet, and this damn bastard dared to tell her to let it go? She felt like she was slowly losing her sanity because of this villain. If he had assisted her like she had asked, 
Wouldn't the culprits be dead and buried by now? Son of A B asterisk asterisk C H. Don't come any closer, she yelled out, as she quickly grabbed a broken ornament piece the size of her palm and shot it at him. Just as she threw it, the lighting flashed and the thunder rang out loud as the piece hit the floor. Deep paw. Since she didn't have enough strength, the piece hit the floor and shattered a little distance in front of Alec. Looking at the tiny pieces in front of him, the anger in his heart doubled. Did she even realize that he could have her killed for attempting to kill the king? He looked at her coldly and quickly but carefully made his way towards her while stepping over the pile of clothes and broken ornaments scattered all over the room. Once he finally reached her, his eyes almost turned misty due to the pungent smell coming from her body. How long had it been since she took a bath? Breathe, Alec. Breathe, he told himself. Just looking at her appearance, he could see flaky and ashy skin on her arms, neck, and face. Especially around her nose, eyes, and mouth. Her reddish-pink lips were so dry and chapped that Alec was afraid that if he ever kissed them, then her blade-like lips would slice through his own instantly. Disgusting. Alec quickly held Arginia's arms and took another piece of ornament in her hand that she was about to throw at him. Let me go, you bastard. You don't care for our child at all. You. The more she struggled, the more Alec rough handled her. He hurriedly carried her and violently threw her on the messy bed. Her clothes and body were all soaked from her sitting under the window the entire time. You there. Bring me a rope. He yelled out angrily. Five minutes later, he had successfully tied both her feet and hands together. The smell of her fouled odor, coupled with the smell of her wet clothes, had gotten the best of Alec. He really couldn't take it any longer. You stink, he said while holding his nose. You there, get her cleaned and changed, while the rest of you make sure that his room is spotless. He commanded. Yes, your majesty. They answered. Everyone, get out and leave us for a bit. Alec commanded, as he looked and smiled at Arginia arrogantly. Once everyone had left, he slowly traced his hands on her collarbones, shoulders, and neck. My beloved, wouldn't you say that I've given you enough time already? Do you know how long six months is? It looks like I've pampered you too much these years. So starting from today, you won't have a choice anymore. When I want you to perform, you do it. When I want you to jump, then you jump. And if you aren't able to please me, then you'll just have to do it over and over again until you get it right. And if you don't do it the way I like it, then you can kiss getting revenge for your daughter goodbye. Remember, if I want you dead, then it will be so. This is your past chance, use it well. I'll come back by nightfall, and I expect you to move your body the way I want you to. Alex said while smiling at the angry but frightened woman. She looked at him, as if looking at a beast. What he said was the truth. If he wanted her dead, then no one would be able to save her. So for the sake of staying alive, taking care of her son James, and finding her daughter's murderer, she had to please this demon with everything that she's got. She stopped struggling and immediately calmed down. Seeing that she had thought it through, Alec unhurriedly untied the ropes and gave her a warning look. You know what to do after this, so do not disappoint me. See you tonight, my beloved. With that, he took off without giving her a second look. She dug her fingernails on her bed in anger. She couldn't breathe, as her heart pounded with force against her ribs from immense anger. She wanted to scream and damage the things that weren't already broken within her room. But she knew that if he lashed out, the maids might hear her and report it back to that damn mother F. Patience. For the time being, it was best for her to act like a docile wife and wait silently. And just like that, Alec had unintentionally added another enemy to his list. Arginia swore that this embarrassment and resentment would be given back to Alec in ten folds. He threatened to kill her? Just you wait, she thought. The maids quickly came into the room and silently did what they were asked to do. They led her into a bathtub the size of a two-meter-wide circular fish pond and gently cleaned her skin, as well as detangle and comb out her messy hair carefully. Because it was raining hard outside, the maids hard-boiled the bathwater so as to keep it hot, lest their master catches a cold. After three hours of skincare and hair care, she headed back to her bedroom chamber which was now spotless. Once they dressed her up, she walked towards her bed and asked everyone to leave. She needed a moment to think. 
For the first time in her life, she felt like a prisoner. How ironic it was that after so many years of love and loyalty, that bastard had decided to treat her like this. The love had instantly cleared from her eyes, and all that was left was pain and resentment. Even though she didn't hate him enough to kill him, she still resented him for not caring enough about her daughter. She turned around and placed her hands under her pillow and was taken aback. She quickly held up her pillow and saw a rolled up letter there. Who could have put it there? Was it Alec? Was it her son? So many questions popped in her head instantly. She slowly sat up and pulled the reddish ropes that were used to tie the rolled up letter. I know who killed your daughter. If you truly want to know the culprits, come to the Vinegar Tavern at 6 p.m. tomorrow. When you arrive, check in at room 7 and gently move the wall mirror to the side. And wait there quietly and patiently. The culprits will be in the next room. Oh, and you can call me Master GP. Please destroy this note when you're done with it. Arginia looked at the note in shock as her hands trembled slightly. Her first thought was that this was a trap. What if this Master GP was the one responsible for killing her daughter? Wouldn't she just be playing at his hands? The man had found a way to get the letter under her pillow. So wouldn't he be the most suitable suspect? A person that could have things moved in and out of the heavily guarded palace would definitely be a powerful and dangerous man. Her daughter had died in a similar manner, with no one being able to trace it back. So how could she truly trust such a mysterious person? Then again, if it was really a trap, wouldn't she also be dead right now? After all, he could poison her food, or even send his men to kill her in silence. But he didn't. So many he wasn't the culprit. And if he was truly to be trusted, why would he show her who the culprit was? No one would do or say anything for free. Was this Master G. P. an enemy to her daughter's killer? Was that why he wanted her to know? If that was the case, then it seemed that he wanted her and the enemy to fight it out to the death. But even so, she didn't mind. Jeanette's murderer had to die, and that was a fact. Argenia was conflicted on what to do. To go, or not to go. That was the question. After thinking for a while, she decided to go. Screw it. This was her first clue to finding her daughter's killer, so taking the risk was definitely worth it. Could she rely on that bastard husband of hers? Nope. She had to make all the moves herself. Right now, the only thing that she was truly curious about was the identity of her informant. Who the hell was this Master G.P.? The next day, Arginia stretched her hands over her head as she groaned with displeasure. It was 3.15 p.m. and she had just woken up. All through the night, and well into the early part of the morning, she had been pleasuring that vagabond. Every time she had fallen asleep, he would wake her up two hours later and continue these tedious adult exercises with her. When he left at 9 a.m., she felt like her ancestors had finally taken pity on her poor body. Her lower body ached with pain. As most of the time, she wasn't in the mood when that beast had penetrated her. She could see blood stains on her beddings, as well as around her thighs. The scoundrel had really forced his way through. Thankfully, before he left, he had told her that today would be her rest day. And tomorrow night, they would continue on from where they had stopped. Oh my heavens, what time was it? She thought, as she looked at the gloomy sky outside. Even though it wasn't raining, the air was cold and windy, and the sun was still hidden away by the clouds. Arginia quickly jumped out of bed and hurried away to look for her maids. Since she had decided to be at the tavern by 6 p.m., how could she dare to be late? She needed to clean up and arrive there around 5.30. For situations like these, it was best for one to come early, as one could never tell if some unforeseen circumstances could occur. The only problem now was bypassing Alex's security. He had specifically said that she needed to rest. So if he found out that she had enough energy to walk about, then he would never give her any resting days again. Before cleaning up, she immediately wrote a letter for her most trusted knight, Benvolio. Benvolio had been with her way before she became queen. He and several other guards had been given by her father as a means to protect herself against Alec if any bad thing happened to her. When she was done, she quickly went to her audience room and sent for Benvolio. My queen. Benvolio sat on bended knees. The man's bluish hair, purplish eyes, and handsome face made him look extremely friendly and approachable, which usually deceived those around him a lot. 
Most people who had never seen him fight thought that he was weak and docile, but when the smiled, most people shrieked in fear. His creepy crazed smile, coupled with the numerous scars and injuries he had left on his enemies, made people bellow away. When he fought, he would smile and laugh, while licking his enemy's blood off his face or hands. It scared the sh asterisk asterisk t out of those who observed his battles, hence his nickname, the Laughing Maniac. Honestly, those back on Earth would easily relate this guy with Hisoka in Hunter x Hunter. Their pale skin and creepy smile literally freaked everyone out. In fact, the only difference between these two were their dressing, eye color, and hair color. Their personalities were too alike. You may rise. I called you here to follow up on your search for my daughter's killer. Have you found him yet? She asked, while throwing the letter towards his direction. Since Alec had requested that these maids pay attention to her every move, that meant that they would probably be listening in on the conversation as well. No, my queen. Benvolio replied with a creepy smile on his face, as he gently picked up the letter a few inches in front of him. He licked his lips playfully and unhurriedly hid the letter away. I only called you here to see how far along you were with the search. Since you haven't found the culprit yet, then we had nothing further to talk about. You're dismissed. With that, Benvolio unhurriedly bowed at her, winked at her, and walked away while smilingly. Looking at him, she could help but feel helpless. Honestly, all through the time that she had spent with him, she could never fully decode what the guy's deal was. In the beginning, he truly frightened her. But after several years of complete loyalty, she had just concluded that he was a mental case. Once he was gone, she quickly called her maids cleaned up and then made up an excuse to go to the royal prayer rooms. She told them that she wanted to pray for her daughter's fortunes in the heavens. My queen, do you want us to pray with you as well? Asked one of her maids. No. I need time alone, so I'll only come out after three hours. She replied. Typically, it wasn't weird for one to spend hours in a prayer home or a temple. If one wanted the souls of their loved ones to have fortune in heaven, then they needed to sit within the temple and polish spiritual stones. These stones were just white pebbles that were found on the coastal shores. If someone's loved one committed 20 sins that they were aware of, then 20 pebbles would be enough to polish. For example, if Adrian believed that her daughter had sinned 12 times her entire lifetime, then 12 stones would be polished. But usually, one could polish as many stones as possible, just in case their loved one committed more sins than they were aware of. White pebbles were used as a sign of purity and were used to purify the souls of the dead. Once the stones were polished, they were thrown into the fire and until their outer appearance turned black. It was believed that during prayers for the dead, as the burning process continued, the soul of the dead would absorb the purity of the pebbles and in turn, the blackness of the stone showed that the soul's sins had been absorbed by the pebble instead. White pebbles were believed to be a natural hurt filian blessing to the world, hence they were used. Once her maids left, she quickly walked towards the backyard of the prayer courtyard and looked left and right suspiciously. Benvolio, come out. You called my queen? He replied, as he popped out from a large wooden barrel. Where Flick and Ron? Here my queen, said two others who jumped out from behind a huge pile of firewood. Good. Now that you all are here, then let's make our escape. But first, where are the clothes that I asked for? Arginia asked. Here they are my queen. Benvolio said while passing on a bag towards her. She quickly went into one of the empty rooms in the courtyard and changed. She had changed her flashy clothes and was presently wearing sack-like male peasant clothing, which cheap male shoes as well. She had also tied her hair like a man and had chosen to wear a cheap mask to go with the outfit. Once she was done, her subordinates aided her in climbing and jumping over the two-meter fence around the prayer courtyard. On the other side of the wall, her other subordinates were already ready with two merchant wagons. Previously, when she was cleaning herself up, her subordinates had quickly gotten merchant wagons and had immediately used Arginia's name and seal to come into the palace as merchants. They claimed that Arginia had specifically asked them to bring their jewelry and makeup products for her to see. They would now leave under the guise that Arginia was praying, and would it come back later again to see if she was still available to see them. Ron, 
You stay back and make sure that no one comes into the prayer courtyard. Flick. Benvolio. You're coming with me on this one. After escaping the palace, they quickly made their way towards the Vinegard Tavern. In this mission, the hooded Benvolio was in charge of talking. The tavern was filled with the strong aroma of ale and sweaty men. There were men seated around the wooden tables that had been soaked with overspilled ale from their cups. Some were toasting and laughing, while others were having a small organized bar fight at the side. Some gambled on these fights, while others slapped the butts of the serving women that passed by. Some were heading upstairs to have their fun with these serving girls, while others were heading downstairs while burrowing up their pants. The trio moved closer to the front desk carefully, as they tried to avoid all the chaos that was currently happening around them. As they moved, the servant girls would call them out seductively. Hey handsome, wanna have a good time with mama? Oh I love mysterious men. Why don't I show you how mysterious I can be as well? Since Adrian was dressed as a man, they also tried to seduce her as well. They touched her arms and clothes as she passed by, while biting their lips and shaking their assets in front of her. Ladies, ladies, I'm a married woman okay, she thought, as she tried to maintain her composure. Check in at room 7, Benvolio said seductively, as he tapped his hands on the front desk playfully. Normally, he would have slaughtered every woman in this room for touching him, but since they were undercover, he had to keep his cool and restrain himself. Just thinking about killing them and seeing their blood spraying out of their bodies made him smile even more. It would indeed be a beautiful sight. The young girl was confused, but because he had asked in a seductive tone, she had chosen to comply with his request. Strange enough, room 7 hadn't been booked all day, which was very odd indeed, but what did she care? The reason why she was confused was because she was usually the one who told people where to be at. So why were these particular guests insistent in being at room 7? Although she wanted to know the reason, she knew better than to let her curiosity get the best of her. She had seen people get killed within this same tavern because they poked their noses into things that didn't concern them. Another thing that piqued her curiosity was the fact that these people were all men. Did they plan to sleep with each other instead? If so, then that would explain why they were turned off by women. After all, it was very common for men to sleep with men, especially those knights who camped out for years and years away from the taste of a woman. It made sense now, the front desk girl thought, as she tried to convince herself that it wasn't that she or any of the other girls were ugly. It was that those three men preferred a man's touch to that of a woman. How else could she explain the fact that three full-grown men would pass up the chance to sleep with hot women that were throwing themselves at them? That must be it. They liked men. While the front desk girl was coming up with her own theories, the supposedly gay trio had just entered the room and had immediately went towards the large silver mirror on the left side of the room. Apparently, this mirror was placed here so that those men could watch their woman's actions from the back as well, so as to heighten their pleasure. Benvolio, Flick, gently lift the mirror away from the wall. The men nodded and did as they were told. The space that was blocked by the mirror had certain tiny holes on it that were hard to see from afar, except one stood right in front of them. Based on the positioning of these holes, it was safe to say that they would be able to hear everything that comes out from those next door, provided they were on the bed. From the holes, one could see the bedsheets just directly below them, meaning that these holes were placed on the front wall of the bed's upper frame. Time passed by quickly, and they soon heard voices next door. Baby. I've missed you, Carrie said, as he closed the door behind Anthony. Adrian on the other side couldn't see them clearly, and could only faintly hear them as they were somewhat far away from the bed. But when they climbed on the bed, she immediately knew who those voices belonged to. She tried to calm her anger and breathed in and out. Sleeping with your sister's fiancé? What a good child, she thought, as she continued to listen in on their conversation. Baby. How long do we need to keep pretending just to be together? Anthony asked. You know that I want to be with you more than anything else. But that bitch's mother is still looking for her daughter's murderer. If we hook up, wouldn't she immediately suspect us? Even if she killed that slut Jeanette, I still think that we should lay low for the time being. But don't worry. I heard that my father has ordered for the old hag to be kept under lock and key within the palace. Carrie said while seductively running her hands across Anthony's back. 
On the other side of the wall, Argenia almost lost her mind when she finally confirmed that this shameless couple had killed her beloved daughter. She calmed herself down and continued to listen in on them. True, but how do we introduce our relationship? Anthony asked. He, I've already thought about it. We could just say that we found comfort in each other. After all, you're grieving and I'm also grieving. So who would question our newfound love? When my brother becomes king, do you think that anyone would dare to question us? Anthony frowned. Although he agreed with what she was saying, Eli would only become king in the future and not now. So what do they do if they get discovered before then? The old hag was indeed a problem. But baby, what if she finds out that we were the ones who killed Jeanette? Even if she finds out, what can she do? She's a bloody prisoner whose life solely depends on my father. If she attempts to kill me, father would definitely not let her go. Do you know why? Carrie asked smilingly. Anthony knitted his brows and shook his head. When Jeanette died, Alec looked for the culprit for just two weeks, before burning down an entire town up display his power and might for his enemies to see. So why would Carrie's situation be any different? It's because of brother. To appease brother, father would probably kill the old hag and her entire family with his own bare hands for brother. It's simple. The old hag gave birth to a useless son, while mother gave birth to the future king. On the other side of the wall, Argenia frowned. What the girl said was true. Even though she wanted revenge, Alec would never support her if it conflicted with Eli's interest. And if he ever dug deep into the matter and found her to be guilty, then her old father, mother, brothers, and sisters, as well as their families, will all be killed. Today's revelation was indeed jaw-dropping. But since she had made up her mind to kill her daughter's murderers, then the shameless couple had to die. Adrian looked at Carrie in particular and smiled coldly. Good child. Ani here will play this game with you a little longer. Riverdale City. Major General Mark and his comrades were presently undercover. His Majesty had assigned him the task of collecting intel in Riverdale City. For this mission, he had brought his girlfriend Ava, as well as five other men and women with him. Originally, he didn't plan on taking her along. But when he said that he would be away for three while months, she immediately insisted on coming with him on this mission. She was also excited, as this would be her first time being an undercover agent. How exciting! Before leaving, everyone had been briefed about their identities. Mark and Ava were newly wedded peasants, who had moved here all the way from the Chusa village four cities away. Their village was burned and raided by bandits, hence they had no choice but to flee. And ever since then, they had been wandering around from city to city like nomads. As for his other male comrades, they were to take the identities of Mark's brothers, who had also traveled with Mark alongside their wives as well. It had been three weeks since they had settled in, and right now, the men Jad successfully gotten work at the fields, while the women stayed at the inn aiding and doing laundry. When they first arrived, they had pleaded with the owner of the inn to hire the women as laundry maids for the guests. This was a great way to pick up intel, since the inn had a bar at its ground level. When there was a bar, they would definitely be drunk people who would talk about the happenings within the city. Gossip was what they needed right now. Just to be safe from harassment, the women had worn several layers of clothing to make themselves look fat, and they had also put dirt and fake black spots on their faces to mask their beauty. Anyone who looked at them right now would be totally turned off by their hideous appearance. So far, they had found out that some captains from the capital had left Riverdale a while ago, and that Shannon's only son, Martyr, was bloodthirsty for his father's killer. Apparently, the knights had escaped when his father was being killed, were immediately killed, and their families weren't let go even after their death. From everything that they had found out, this martyr character was a dangerous and tricky fellow who would old be problematic for Baymart. Hence it was best for them to keep an eye on him while they stayed here. Carriages and horses passed along the busy roads as the peasants walked through the busy city. The roads were muddy and dirty, from the numerous cries from the sky. It was springtime, and the skies were always gloomy. The cool breeze gently massaged the chests of Mike and his men as they carried the last stack of hay towards their employer's barn. On the way, the soldiers on horses and even the snobby rich merchants and noble in carriages would splash puddles on mud water on their bodies. Pui, 
They stink. Honestly, why must we share our roads with these filthy peasants? Just look at their muddy clothes. Don't they have any awareness at all? As they walked by, these upper-class men would sometimes spit at them or insult them alongside other peasants, just to get a rise out of them. But no matter what type of insults were thrown their way, they stayed firm and continued on with their work. One false move, and they could be burned alive as examples for all to see. As they moved, they couldn't help but compare His Majesty's attitude to these so-called nobles. He was truly one in a million. Tsar, what did you find out when you sneaked into the city lord's palace last night? Majo, I mean Mark. It appears that this martyr guy plans to send some of his trusted subordinates towards Omar City, which is just three towns away. Apparently, he believes that Shannon was killed there. So he's personally going there secretly to investigate. In fact, there were so many things that had puzzled Mark. Why did the survivors not confess about the fact that Baymard was responsible for Shannon's death? Were they scared silly by the attack from back then, that they had made up their own stories in their heads? No matter how he looked at it, something didn't add up. Well, provided they weren't looking toward Baymard for revenge, then he wouldn't be bothered. And what about Martyr? What will he be up to during this time? He said that he would like to recruit and build up more forces for the time being. From what I reckon, more than 90% of his father's soldiers had been destroyed by us. So although he had his own forces, it would still be nothing when faced with a powerful enemy. I think he plans to lay low and act docile for the time being. This is also good. We need to make sure that no enemy heads on towards Baymard witch out our knowledge. Mark said, just to keep an eye on the road leading to Baymard, they had all chosen to work on the fields facing that direction. From the hilly fields, they could see and observe the roads outside the gates while working. The men continued their discussion as they walked towards the barn. Czar, Hoden, when we get to the inn, you two focus on drinking with those at the bar. Pay attention to every minor detail. I want to know everything that's happening within the city. The two men nodded as they listened on. Nimbo, how much longer before the city map is completed? I need two more weeks to complete it, Majo. Sorry, Mark. Nimbo replied. It was hard for them not to call Mark, Major General Mark. He was their major and leader for heaven's sake. Good. Continue taking your normal stroll around the city until you get it done. As for me, I'll head on towards the market area to collect intel as well. But before that, I think we should lay low for the time being as well. Someone has been watching us. Back in Baymard, everyone was busy. The public school students had already school, while those at the academies were already done with their final examinations. Three weeks had already passed since His Majesty had left, and the workers had immediately dived back into their work. No one wanted to disappoint His Majesty. At the plastic making department, Supervisor Moriarty was busy working supervising and inspecting the new dolls from the new doll making sector. Careful, careful, he said as he watched the men pour the pasty liquidy plastic into the molds. The workers carefully carried the large pocket if liquid plastic and poured it carefully into the mold. The liquid dripped like thick glue as it fell onto the molds. The liquidy polyethylene plastic used had been mixed with an orange dye so as to make it look skin-like. In this world, people had four main skin tones, white, black, blue, and pink. And of course, each skin tone had its own shade as well like deep pink, pale pink, and so on. As for the people within the Pino continent, their skin tone was whitish, with an orange undertone to it. Of course, due to the slaves and merchants from different continents, the people knew about some of these skin tones. Hence, Landon didn't see anything wrong in creating them. Who knows? Maybe merchants from those places can come over and buy them from him. Another thing that was noteworthy was the fact that black-slash-deep drownish eyes were very rare. Even those with black skin tones had colorful eyes ranging from white to violet. In fact, most of them looked like Storm from X-Men when her eyes turned white. Taking all this into account, his Landon had also requested for the dolls to be made with different skin tones and sizes as well. Anyway, the plastic was placed into the molds. And when it cooled down, 50 tiny plastic body parts were formed. So each mold could make 50 left arms, 50 right legs and so on. When the molds were done, they were sent immediately to be painted, before they got put together. For this part, 
The workers had to be careful. Barbie's lips, teeth, eyebrows, nails and so on needed to be painted on carefully. And if they made any mistake, then they could just use alcohol to wipe the paint off and start all over again. As the workers painted away, Moriarty walked around and inspected the doll's makeup. Before His Majesty had left, he had left them with close to 30 different portraits for how Barbie should look like, irrespective of skin tone. In some of the portraits, Barbie had a smoky eye makeup, with a long winged eyeliner and pink lips, while in others, Barbie only had average makeup on. In essence, each portrait had a different outfit, makeup, and accessories. Landon had tried to relate her to every profession in Baymart. In some, she was a knight, while in others, she was a teacher, scientist, nurse, doctor, and so on. Moriarty was amazed at how clear and surreal the portraits looked. If His Majesty wasn't king, Moriarty was sure that by now, he would be a renowned painter. Supervisor Moriarty, what do you think about this look? It's good, but make the eyeliner wing a little bit longer. What about mine, Supervisor Moriarty? Please look at mine too. Me too. At the beginning, Barbie's makeup was done very poorly. Hence, all those dolls that had been made then had to be reheated back into liquid plastic and redone again. But after three weeks of doing this daily, the workers had improved their painting techniques significantly. Granted, there were still a lot of things that needed to be changed, but Moriarty was sure that by the next 60 days, two months, they would definitely get it right. After the paint had dried off, the rest of the body was put together, while the head was sent off to the next group of workers who would sew in Barbie's hair. The hair was literally made from polymer nylon and was sewn into the head using those old steam sewing machines from the textile industry. The sewing machines churned, as they sewed the different colored nylon polymer fibers into Barbie's head. And once they were done, the head was sent to attached with the other body parts. Body parts like the head, limbs, and arms all had ball sockets at their connecting joints, so as to force the balls into the holes at places like Barbie's neck and shoulders. Up next, Barbie's outfit was gotten from the textile industry and worn on her. Of course, her plastic shoes, Bags and other accessories are also but tether in a next transparent plastic box. As for how the Max design got printed, it was done in a similar manner like paper money. The box design and drawing was imprinted on a steel plate. From there, a die was added on the outline of each stroke and line within the design. Following that, a thin transparent plastic sheet was placed on the top of the steel plate and backed for eight minutes. And at that point, the image and die colors on the steel plate gets transferred to the transparent plastic sheet. The whole process was very similar to making different colored paper money. That particular transparent plastic sheet would pass through six more steps before it would finally be used to print out identical designs over one hundreds of cardboard boxes all at once. Well, the first few process steps were only done within the first of the month. Those first steps were only needed to get the exact design for Barbie's boxes. But once they made specific designs for all 30 design types, they immediately began printing out hundreds and hundreds of copies on different colored boxes. His Majesty had stated that Barbie could only have three main box colors, pink, white, and red. Moriarty held the box in his hand that already contained Barbie and her accessories within it. Three quarters of the box's front was made of transparent plastic, while the rest of the box was made of a pinkish cardboard box. After inspecting most of the Barbie products for a while, he continued on to look at more dolls within the storage room. This sector had 550 workers who were all in charge of making plastic toys. They made several toys like Wonder Woman, Mulan, Superman, and so on. Generally, each toy had 20 molds that could produce at least 50 tiny body parts from it. A day, at least 200 people would be present for each shift, and they would sit there for eight hours and make over hundreds of plastic toys. So every day, they make at least 600 toys from both shifts. Granted, that 600 could mean 50 Mulan toys, 20 Superman toys, and so on. But all in all, 600 were made daily. And by the end of the week, they would generally make over 3,000. The thing that took time was to paint the toys. If they workers got more proficient, then more toys would be produced daily. Hence, as time goes by, it's evident that production will also increase as well. All in all, Moriarty was pleased with the results so far. It was indeed a beginner's job well done. Momo, 
Hurry up, we're going to be late, yelled Linda as she rushed towards the newly constructed building within the school premises. Little Momo and her were on their way towards the chemistry laboratory. Today, they were taking chemistry three. Ever since the beginning of April, they had been taking six main courses. Biology 1, Classes of Living Organisms. Math 4, Simple Variable Math, like Find X. Chemistry 2, Chemistry 3, Introduction to Lab Science. Physics 1, Fino 4. Apart from these ones, they also had other fun and creative courses that occurred once a week, like Arts and Craft 1, Ethics and Morality 1, Health and Hygiene 1, Literature 1, Music 1, and Physical Education. Another surprising thing for the students was that this year, the school had created a student council body based on the votes from the students. Also, each class had a class monitor and deputy class monitor that's entrusted in assisting the teachers in class, aiding the weak students, roll call, and so on. No matter what amongst the two leaders, one had to be female and the other male. Generally, once the winners for both the male group and female group emerged, the students would then vote between the two and choose who should be the class monitor or deputy class monitor. For the biology class, the students were taught the basics like cells, microbes, plant systems, animal systems, invertebrates, and vertebrates. In short, they were taught about all the classes of living organisms. Of course, for Math 4, they focused on simple variable math, like 5x equals 10, find x. In that class, they focused on understanding one to two variable equations, which were usually linear equations. For Chemistry 2, the students would still focus on reactions, atoms, and so on. But now with the use of calculators, they had begun learning about calculating molecular weight and so on. Of course, just so that the students could breathe a little, music, literature, physical education, and arts and craft were essentially a must. In short, this semester was a busy one. Today, Linda and Little Momo were heading towards the chemistry lab in the new school building. Once they got in, they immediately climbed the stairs until they arrived at the third floor where they were greeted with a large group of students outside the lab. The area was bustling with busy students. Friends greeted each other with hugs or playful punches, while others had their eyes glued on their books as they continued doing assignments that were due in the next class. Some already had their lab coats and safety wears on, while others were busy wearing theirs on now. In fact, everyone was doing their own thing as they waited for the class to begin. Instantly, the duo opened their bags and quickly pulled out their neatly folded lab coats and safety items. For this class, everyone was required to wear their lab coats, gloves, rubber boots, and goggles. Linda looked at her watch and knew that it would soon be time for them to go in. And right on cue, Mother Kim and Teacher Gofin opened the lab doors from instead and ushered the students in. Morning, Teacher Kim. Morning, Teacher Gofin. Morning, Teacher. Everyone greeted their teachers as they walked in and immediately found their usual spot. The laboratory was massive, with several working slabs, cupboards with equipment stored in them, and a small storage room at its front. Linda and Momo immediately spotted their other group members and rushed over to join them. Ever since the beginning of the semester, they had been put in groups of five. Apparently, these people would be their lab partners throughout the entire semester. All right, before we begin, you all know the drill. In front of each group are five question sheets. You all have seven minutes to answer them. Remember, no cheating and no copying. These small tests make up 20% of your final grade. Now, begin. Linda immediately flipped her question sheet and got to work. For this Chemistry 3 course, they had one theory class on Tuesdays and one lab session on Thursdays. And at the beginning of each lab session, they would have mini quizzes that would test them on what they had learned in their Tuesday classes. Chemistry 3 was a course based on laboratory work, so they had to know about the equipments in front of them, safety lab hazards, and so on. In fact, ever since the students knew that these questions were 20%, they had taken them seriously. Linda filled her name and school number on the question sheet before proceeding to answer the questions. The questions were straight to the point and easy to answer if one was paying attention during lectures. And just like that, time flew by quickly. Seven minutes later, the quizzes collected back by Teacher Gofin. And the papers were collected, Mother Kim began distributing the lab manual sheets for today's experiment. 
All right. Before we begin our laboratory experiment, let's recap on what Teacher Winnie has been you all in chemistry too. Mother Kim said. The students immediately took out their books and writing materials, while others flipped the pages of their books to the last pin-filled page. It was important for the students to know about what reactions they were going to perform today, hence it was good for them to recap on what they were previously taught. So as usual, let's look back on what you all have been learning so far. I need a few examples of chemistry around us. Anyone? Mother Kim asked, as she waited for the students to raise their hands. Yes, Philippa? She said, while pointing at a little girl at the front of the room. Air is essentially chemistry because it's constantly undergoing a chemical change. For example, we breathe out carbon dioxide and take in oxygen, so air is always changing. Also, air undergoes changes whenever smoke is released into the atmosphere by burning, hence it's part of chemistry. Correct. Any other examples of chemistry around us? Kim asked. Our bodies. The ocean. When we make bread. As Kim listened to all of the examples of chemistry around us, she nodded in acknowledgement. But when someone gave bread making as an example, some people giggled, as they thought that it was definitely wrong. How could bread making be chemistry? Good, good, good. These are all good examples. Now, let's focus on bread making, which is essentially baking. As she spoke, some of the students looked at her in doubt. They weren't buying it at all. Let's step back for a little bit and go back to the basics. What is chemistry? Again, some people raised their hands up, while others flipped through their books. Yes, Callus. It's the science of different kinds of matter and how that matter changes. Correct. So how do we link baking and chemistry together? She asked. Everyone thought for a while, before more hands were raised up again. Both baking and chemistry require careful timing and measuring, someone answered. Both of them are a result of the formation of a mixture. Wonderful. In baking, we can change matter, like eggs, butter, milk and flour into a new mixture, which would later be used in creating bread. And likewise in chemistry, several substances form mixtures which give rise to new products. So in essence, when there's a change of matter, then a chemical reaction has occurred. Even mixing and creating the dough is chemistry. And even more so, heating the dough under fire will change the dough's properties and make it hard hence forming bread. Oh. The students responded. As Mother Kim spoke, Linda and her group members continued to write down all the key points like mixtures, chemical change, and so on. Ever since she started taking chemistry classes, her view on the world had changed. She began wondering what chemical reaction would give rise to this, and what chemical reaction would give rise to that. In fact, her whole world was now filled with chemistry. Can anyone give an example of a chemical change that cannot be undone? Teacher Goffin asked. Linda immediately raised her hand. When wood burns? As the wood burns, it changes into ash. The ashes can never change back to wood. So burning is a chemical change which can never be undone again. And what are the characteristics of chemical changes? Some chemical changes make matter change color, like the blackness of the ash. They also make the smell change, like when the bread is just removed from the oven. Sometimes they also release light and gases, and other times, they give off or take in heat. When teaching chemistry, Landon had told the teachers to always relate everything to the things done daily. People were more inclined to remember something if they could relate it to things that they could see daily. If they had just taught the children without these examples, Landon was sure that even if some of them had passed their exams, most of them would have done so be my cramming. But if they could relate everything to the food they ate, the things they did, and their life experiences, then most of the concepts would stick in their brains. And because of this teaching method, the students had really become inquisitive as time went by. They would ask about why the sky was blue, why the grass was green, or even why water was clear and so on. Once their recap session was done, they finally began experimentation. If you answered the questions on the quiz correctly, then you'd be able to identify the tools in front of you. Today, we will be doing two experiments. Up first, we'll be making elephant toothpaste. As for the last experiment, I'll tell you all once you're done with this one. Now, let's focus on making that toothpaste. Each group should find several beakers in front of you, as well as two measuring cylinders, one round bottom flask, two stirrers, and a thermometer in front of each group. 
Some of the beakers in front of you are already filled with ingredients like water, liquid soap, and potassium iodide. But for chemicals like hydrogen peroxide, each group would have to send someone to come and get it from me once you're ready to begin. Also, each slab has just two small electric Bunsen burners on them. So since there are six teams on each slab, I suggest you share nicely. Previously, I had distributed printed lab manuals to each group. Hence, if any of you still have questions about the instructions on the lab manuals, don't hesitate to call either me or Teacher Gofin for assistance. And remember, please label whatever chemical or ingredient you take from us before you continue your experiments. Now begin. Linda and her team immediately read through the instructions carefully and recorded everything in front of them. They recorded things like the color of potassium iodide and its smell before experimentation. Some people started measuring the exact volumes and quantities needed for the experiment, while the others focused on boiling the water. The students went to the electric Bunsen burners and heated the water to a slightly higher temperature than what was required. And while the others kept measuring the proper amounts needed, those handling the hot water placed a thermometer in it and waited for it to cool down to the required temperature needed. Once everything was recorded, measured, and ready, they immediately began adding all the ingredients according to their lab manuals and stepped back just as the instructions had advised. The solution started foaming up and instantly shot out of the large cylindrical flask. Since Linda and her group were the first ones to complete this experiment, everyone looked at the foam in marvel. Awesome. So cool. Look, it's still flowing out of the flask. Why does it smell like lemons? Those who saw it, got pumped up and wanted to complete their own experiments as well. Linda and her team were still stupefied by what they were seeing. How? How did these liquid substances turn to foam? We were just mixing the ingredients in, without fire. So why did the substances change their form so fast? Was it because of the hot water? Quick, quick. Let's record what we saw before we forget. Linda said excitedly. Linda was amazed at the rapid change that occurred right now. She looked at the ink in her pen, the book she was writing on, and even the tiny veins that she could see on her wrists. Chemistry was everywhere around her. She breathed it, she lived it, and she herself was a part of it. It was like a great force that connected everything in the world. This was her own unique understanding of chemistry. Far away from the calm and busy Baymard was a ship that had finally reached its destination. Landon looked at the shores of Corona and smiled. It was finally game time. Loplin City, the empire of Corona. The night sky was dark, cold, and cloudy. It was currently 8 p.m., and Landon's ship had already docked at the port. Landon stepped out of the ship captain's office and felt the damp breeze sweetly blowing against his face. The whole place smelled of fish and salt. The city was indeed busy. Landon could see several groups of moving goods in and out of their ships. There were also fishermen on tiny boats a little distance from the harbor who were leaning against their boats as they lifted a net filled with fish. Some on the shores were currently selling their catch to the housewives and restaurant owners, while others stood there cleaning and cutting out the unwanted parts of the fish. For them, the ocean was a source of cleaning water, as well as a good garbage bin for all their dirt. The whole place was chaotic as everyone hurriedly did their tasks. As he stood on the balcony, he could hear the tiny whistles of the sea's waves singing their lullabies to the world. Are you sure you can get it done undetected? Landon asked the hooded Santa. Of course. Little bro just wait here for two more hours, and it shall be done. And with that, Santa get off the ship with some of his men. From the map, Landon had found out that there were three underground camps. All of them were around the shores, so as to make it easier for the slaves to get in without the authorities noticing. The only point was that they were all scattered around different coastal cities within Corona. For example, the first camp was situated eight hours away by horseback from the coastal city that they were currently in. In fact, they needed to travel past a few villages and cities before getting there. The second one was a 14-hour ride away from the Windell coastal city. And the third one was a day's ride from Grendel coastal city. For Landon's plan to work, he needed Santa to get at least four other ships for the slaves to hop into when they freed them. As for things like wagons, Landon had decided that they would buy them from the towns or cities that were close to these underground camps. Of course, the money for all this would come from Santa's pockets. 
Since they were aiding them in taking care of this issue, the least Corona could do was to pay the bills. Landon wasn't that charitable. Also, Santa had to get 502 war horses for the Landon and his men as well. Fortunately, Santa had a mansion at almost all coastal ports, since his goods got delivered and shipped in and out of Corona frequently. One should know that Santa, as a very wealthy merchant, had thousands of guards at most of his ports. So for sure, he would have 502 war horses readily available for them. While they waited for Santa, the men began eating their supper. They were about to travel on an eight-hour journey, so supper was indeed essential. Time flew back, and finally, Santa was back. Everything is ready just outside the city. Little bro, how many days will it take before you come back? Should I send you more guards? No, no. Should I go with you? Santa asked anxiously. Now that it was time for his little bro to head out, he couldn't help but get worried. His little bro was actually going to go head-on with Nopline's forces. Sure, Baymard had indeed changed, but that didn't mean that they were strong. He had a hunch that there would be at least 1,000 men each, guarding these camps. So how could 500 go against such huge numbers? Plus, from what he had heard, his bro couldn't fight at all. Wasn't this just rushing towards instant death? He had visited other cities in Arcadina and had heard about his bro, so from everything that he had gathered, he knew that this little bro of his was somewhat weak when it came to fighting. And even if the knights had taught him during this one-year period, it wasn't enough for him to improve greatly. Sword fighting took years to achieve. From the age of seven, the men were constantly being trained in the way of the sword. Sure, his bro had practiced when he was in Arcadina, but his bro was always the weakest in his class. Plus, how could a 16-year-old compete with experienced men who have worked as guards or even gone to war? Some of the men that they would face today would be over the age of 25, and he would be a fool to believe that his bro of 16 years old had more skills than them. Somehow, he felt that this might be the last time that he would see his bro. He felt that he had pushed everything onto his bro's shoulders. He, he felt sad. But how could he have known that not only was Landon very capable, he had guns and bullets to kill all these motherf asterisk 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 heirs easily. Very soon he would know how silly he was in worrying about Landon, but that would all be in the future. Bro, I assure you, I won't lose. As for the number of days that we'll use, I guess you could say that we'll be back in three days' time, so wait for us here. What I need you to do right now is to ready the ships. We need enough crew members and ships to hold all the slaves from all three camps. But all in all, the entire mission should be done in no more than 15 days. As for your fears about Nopline, trust me a little bit more, will you? I meant what I said. I won't be the one at it the loosing end, so there's no need for you to worry so much. Landon assured. How could he loose? As far as he was concerned, this was just target practice for the men. That was all. Santa looked at him and helplessly shook his head. His little bro was indeed as stubborn as his future wife. Talking to him was like talking to a brick wall. Sigh. Fine. I'll believe you on this one. But if it gets too tough, do me a favor. Run. Sure. After Landon spoke to Santa for a while, he and his men quickly wore their hooded cloaks and immediately got off the ship. Once the men stepped onto the harbor, they became extremely vigilant as they walked past the busy crowd. In their minds, their mission had already begun. The outskirts of Reginal City, Corona. After eight long hours of journeying through Corona, they had finally made it towards their destination. On their way here, they had decided to pass through the forest trails rather than the roads. It would be somewhat suspicious if people see over 500 cloaked men walking into Corona. Even worse, people might begin failing them due to curiosity. One had to know that for one of these camps to be so close to Reginal City, meant that those people in power within the city were aware of everything that went on there. Maybe they were threatened to keep their mouths shut, or they were bribed. Either way, walking on the roads would bring attention to their potential enemies. They might even suspect that it was the queen or the nobles that had sent them, and that wasn't what Landon wanted. That's why they had passed through a forest trail that was commonly used by merchants during this journey. There were several merchant forest trails that led towards Reginal City from the Lopland's coastal city, but Landon chose the most difficult and dangerous trail of all. In this way, 
They were guaranteed to not meet too many people on the way. It was usually difficult because of the terrain and dangerous because bandits hid there. But all in all, Landon saw this as more practice for the men. Funny enough, their entire journey was blissful, and no one had even attempted to attack them. This was because they were too many in numbers, and those bandits were only like 50 or so in a tiny group. Real blood gangs colonize villages, towns, and even cities. They would never come out to hide in the woods just to steal goods. Instead, they would have the entire town give them a certain percentage of their monthly products and money. Hence these bandits who hid in the woods all day were indeed small fries. And generally since most merchants had stopped using these dangerous roads, most of these petty thieves had also changed their stealing locations to the other forest trails as well. Anyway, Landon and his men had currently camped on top of a cliff that oversaw Reginald City. Landon walked around their campsite and marked the entire region on the system. In fact, ever since he had been moving about, he had been mapping and marking the trail on the system's map. Granted, he could see every other place in this world if he wanted to. But when it wasn't his territory, he would have to pay the system to do so. He was trying to save more points to level up again. So how could he allow himself to be so thrifty? Even though Corona wasn't his territory, he still marked and added the trail and this campsite as part of his territory. In this way, even if he wanted to view this particular part back in Baymard, he wouldn't necessarily need to pay the system again. Everything costed points, and he was currently low on those right now. He has spent points on getting information on making money, missile rocket launches for the city walls, food, toys, and so on. Listen up. It's 5.35 a.m., and I assume that everyone is dead tired. So, I'll let you all rest till 1 p.m. While you sleep, I'll stay up and guard the camp. Now, go to bed. That's an order. Silence. Everyone was taken aback. They hadn't seen His Majesty sleep, so how could they allow him to guard the camp while they slept? Wasn't he tired as well? Somehow, the idea didn't sit well with them. Granted, they were tired and sleepy as hell. But how could they have the heart to allow their commander and king stay awake while they snored away? They truly felt touched. His majesty was kind and selfless. Gary and Trey were somewhat uncomfortable with the idea as well. They felt like if they truly followed Landon's command, they'd have nightmares instead of a sound sleep. How could they allow their king to accomplish such a task all on his own? Immediately, several people wanted voiced out their complaints. But before they had a chance to say anything, Landon had issued out his orders again. I understand and appreciate everyone's concern, but let's not forget why we are here. When the night falls, you all will have your first rescue mission. Tonight, all of you will save those poor children who have been captured by those animals. To those innocent children, you will be their light and hope in this cold and dark world. Those children have all experienced the worst of this world. From being kidnapped, forced sexually, starved, and even forced to kill others in a cage. These children have seen it all. Some of them have cried and even thought of killing themselves, while others have died due to poor health. Some of them haven't even eaten for several days now, while others haven't even slept all through the night. So tell me, is my sleep more important than theirs? I can afford to this because I know how important this mission is. I need you all to do your best during battle, hence you must go to bed now. Every single one of you here is very dear to me, so I wouldn't want any of you to lose your lives during battle because of sleep deprivation. Now, I'll say it one last time. Go to sleep. This time, the men immediately obeyed. They knew that His Majesty was right, but it was just that as they drifted away into dreamland, they still felt a bit of pain in their hearts at the thought that His Majesty wasn't sleeping as well. Truthfully, there was nothing for them to be worried about. System. Inform me if anyone attempts to climb this hill from any direction. Landon said inwardly. The cliff was currently at the edge of a tall hill. And just below the cliff was the official road leading into Reginald City. Yes, host, the system replied. Also, inform me when any of my men have woken up as well. Normally, Landon would have used a time capsule pill and rest within the sitem. But in this particular situation, it would just be a waste of points. Which he didn't have enough of. One hour in the real world was five days in the time capsule. So since he had asked the men to sleep for 7.5 hours, wouldn't that be too much time for him to spend within the time capsule just to sleep? And even if he bought just one capsule, 
After one hour, he would need to get out, which would be around 6.30 a.m. What'll he be doing from that time till 1 p.m.? Sleeping in the real world was the only situation. Hence, he decided to climb on one of the massive trees a little distance from the camp and sleep on its wide branches. He had the system, so if anything happened, he would know. After making a comfortable tree bed, he quickly turned on his monitor and watched the campsite. The fatigued men were all fast asleep. He closed his eyes shut and immediately joined them in dream world. Tonight was going to be bloody show.